Hello and welcome to the Undercut Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jesse Billington, and we are back to preview this weekend's 2024 Japanese Grand Prix. Now we're at the start of the season, and I say we, I mean all three of us, but not the usual three, as I'm joined first of all by none other than Mr. Timo Albers Daly. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Mr. Billington. How are you? Still? Not too bad. Um, they're sort of delving into a regular week, really, doing doing my day job of writing about classic cars and um, all the reporting that goes with that. So um, busy, but sort of fumbling through it as ever. Same and, old, same old. Yeah, same old, same old. And joining us again for another episode is Lower Lap Times Martin Villari. Um, welcome back to the podcast. How are you? And congratulations, I think, on being the first guest to ever do two back-to-back mainline episodes. <laughs> Going well, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed the first one. So back again to preview the Japanese Grand Prix, a very technical circuit. So uh, hopefully can add some value to yourself and the listeners. A circuit that's also handily very much close to your time zone. I mean, we're recording this at, what, 8 p.m. sort of GMT on a Wednesday evening. But for you, it is uh, damn near 6 a.m. or not quite 6 a.m. yet either. Yeah, nearly 6 a.m. So that's one of my New Year's resolutions to start getting up earlier. So don't worry too much. <laughs> we've, we've We're happy to help where we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With that in mind, though, we'll dive straight into looking at um, some news ahead of this weekend's Grand Prix, actually. And the interesting news when it comes to the feeder series, certainly, is Kimi Antonelli has been penciled in to drive the W12, which was Mercedes 2021 Challenger, at the Red Bull Ring later this month. And this will be his first drive in an F1 car. So clearly they're sort of making the right noises about getting him into the big seats soon. But do we think this is... Uh, getting him lined up to start next year or is there a bit more of a plan for him? I think he really needs to develop more this year in Formula 2 before he comes anywhere close to being for setting himself in uh, that 2025 seat. Inside F2 suggested a little while ago that maybe he's doing the slow burn approach to the season where the first half he gets to to grips with the series and then we'll see the internet we were promised in the second half of the season but if he continues down the path that he's been continuing on at the moment and that doesn't happen, maybe that's the closest he'll get to an F1 car for the foreseeable future. And if we're basing it off just what we've seen so far, then it would be a very ballsy move by Mercedes to put him in that car permanently next year. So it'll be an interesting test, especially with that car being the last good Mercedes, let's say, and good at being an understatement for, for that particular model. Um, and at the Red Bull Ring, where it has gone fairly well. So it's just going to be interesting to see how he does. And as long as he doesn't bin it, then in theory, it should be fine. Yeah, for me, it's interesting that they've picked um, Austria to to chuck Antonelli in. That tells me that it's not really an assessment of of Kimi. Austria is a very straightforward circuit. So it's a non-technical circuit. It's, and it's also got a lot of elevation. So it's going to give him a chance to play with the braking tools and play with the engine braking tools whilst still just giving him time in the seat. I don't think they really know at this point, like whether they want to put him in. It's just, you know, let's get him in the wheel on an easy track and see how he goes and give him an opportunity to play with some of the braking tools as well. Because obviously when you break uphill, you know, we run a different braking setup when you break downhill. Again, another totally different braking setup. So it's just going to give him the chance to play with that in a safer way. And the track's non-technical, like they haven't thrown him in uh, Japan or, you know, when they really want to assess his speed, I'm sure a different track will come up. Yeah, oh, it's exactly that. It's one of those things, if you can master the basics as such, then that's good news for you. And if you can't do that, then that is an issue. And potentially the reason they're doing such an easy circuit in comparison to so many of the other ones is because of that jump he's made straight into Formula 2 being as potentially challenging and visibly challenging as it has been so far. But let's not throw too much at him in one go and we'll be nice about it for this one. It'd be a shame to have honed the talent for as long as they have for them to then bin it all now and kind of do a Red Bull with it where they tend to with a lot of their junior drivers of here's a few races and then nope, too bad, next one. Yeah, the, the setup seems to be very similar to Ferrari with the way they'd had Oli Behrman and Robert Schwartzman taking around previous chassis Ferraris around Maranello. It's a sort of a relatively sort of neutral playground for them to get used to the technicalities of the modern F1 cars, get used to the technical step up between the chassis and from F2 to F1 more so than sort of finding out what their pace is like against other drivers on the field. So this is, yeah, this is very much sort of a neutral playground for Antonelli to just sort of get 
at ease with the F1 technology. But he's not the only junior driver that's lining up for a F1 drive of sorts. And Ayumu Wasa is back and driving the RB this weekend in place of Daniel Ricciardo in FP1. And obviously we know all the teams have to run a junior driver in both their chassis across the season. And I think it's almost certainly going to stir up a bit of discussion as soon as the RB announced that they were going to have someone in Danny Ricciardo's place for an FP1 drive. I think it's great that we've got Ayumu Wasa getting this chance, though, at what would be his home Grand Prix. From a marketing perspective, it's brilliant because you've got two Japanese drivers in F1 cars at the Japanese Grand Prix, so that's a no-brainer. And Iwasa being in Super Formula isn't not in the spotlight this year, but he's kind of adjacent to it, which is a shame because it's a very competitive series, but it's just another one of those ones that doesn't get enough attention as it probably should. And for him even though it's very early in the season and regardless of any speculation that we'll get to in a minute with everything else going on, especially with everything going on, the top team, never mind RB, in terms of what the hell is going to be happening with the drivers there, it's a good session for him to just not even have to be that impressive, just don't bin it, have a nice time, do kind of what Ollie Behrman did in a way, but on a smaller scale, and just remind everyone that you're there because he is a serious contender for that 2025 seat at RB Minardi. And you'd like to see a Japanese driver on the grid. And if it's him instead of Yuki next year, I don't think the Japanese fans will mind too much because they'll at least still have one Japanese driver on the grid. So either they get two or if they get one, but either way they're winning. Yeah, absolutely. For, for me, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for Iwasa because, like you said, Timo, there's there's no expectations really around the circuit like Japan. It's such a technical, challenging circuit and it bites you if you make a mistake. The track's very skinny as well. So I think the pressure is off in, in that sense, but also it's a fantastic opportunity. Like if he can put in a strong practice session around a circuit like Japan, you know, that holds more weight than, you know, doing a strong practice around Austria, like we discussed already. Um, but for Daniel's point of view as well, missing FP1 around the track like Japan is going to hurt his whole weekend. You know, every every corner is critical information there. So that's, you know, there's an opportunity there for, for Iwasa and a, a big disadvantage to Daniel, who, you know, arguably is already struggling. I think no pressure the, thing is also really key because of Piastri being a perfect example for that last year. It's a track he didn't know. There wasn't too much expectation from him in, a, in his rookie year. And we'd have been satisfied. The team would have been satisfied if he'd been in the top 10, considering, like you say, the technical nature of the circuit. But then to him to then go on to be on the podium and be kind of nipping a little bit at the very least at Lando's heels and was definitely the quicker car for a bit because Lando asked for them to be inverted and in sensing a pattern there. It kind of shows that as long as you get over the bare minimum in terms of impressing your team and everyone else outside of it, you don't have to do too much. It's just a case of please keep it out of the walls. Mm. Mm. This is a circuit that Iwasa knows as well because he has just raced there uh, last month in Super Formula there. Opening rounds were held at Suzuka. So he's going to be relatively up to speed with the layout of the track, breaking points, turning in points. And equally, the Super Formula cars, as much as we sometimes see it as a bit of a feeder series, they aren't that much of a step away from the Formula One cars when it comes to their sort of technical nature. So it's a great sort of leaping off point for him to really jump into this RBC and seize this opportunity with both hands. They're could be a lot of impressive times on display or at least just consistency at the very least yeah agree jesse i think they just have to be careful not to stick him on a, like a race run on a hard tire or something because that's you know that is a sink or swim situation just give him a soft tire give him 20 laps of fuel in the car and just let him go around initially i hope they just don't put him into one of their usual race run programs you know because he's not going to enjoy it. His data is not relevant anyway. Like, let's just give him confidence first. So let it be interesting to see what tyre they chuck him out on in, in his first lap. So I'll keep an eye out for that. And based off Perez last year, just keep him away from him so he doesn't get punted out immediately. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to wait and see how that one pans out. But it does also lead ne nicely into the next point, which is the sort of ongoing hearsay around Daniel Ricciardo's seat, which has 
to some been under pressure with Liam Lawson waiting in the sidelines. And equally, the fact that Daniel Ricciardo's performances against Yuki in the opening three races have proven to be slower than Nick de Vries was in comparison over the same races last year. Last year in qualifying, where both Yuki and Nick were in the same sessions, um, Yuki was 0.41 of a second faster than Nick across the sort of sessions they competed in against Daniel it's 0.446 so it's small margins but we're sort of seeing a pattern emerge that might not be great if you're a fan of DR3 and there's been rumor spreading through the paddock that was that Danny Rick was on sort of a shorter contract he would be replaced come summer and um, if his performance wasn't there but ultimately Helmut Marko has come forward and said that there will be performance reviews coming in the summer but he wasn't able to sort of sort of confirm that essentially he's got two races at this point so um yeah, interesting times. I think it's all a bit of hot air, really. I mean, Lawrence Merkies has said that RB need to give Ricardo Kai more comfortable with. It's only natural that Yuki would be quicker in a car, more tailored to him and at a team where he's been for four years. And if anything, given the time that Yuki has had in the team, the fact that he isn't even quicker than Ricardo in some respects should be something worth talking about too. And it's also worth noting that, I mean, obviously they're not going to come out at such an early stage and go against him, but Mekis and Bayer are very much sticking to their claim of being 100% behind Ricardo. So I think it's also worth pointing out that Ricardo obviously hasn't forgotten how to drive. It's just taking him a bit more time to get set up and finding the exact rhythm for the car that he wants with it. And he's had a very off and on time with it. McLaren obviously didn't seem too interested in tailoring the car to him at all. They would just seem very focused on Lando and Oscar's just taking this approach of, I'm going to take the beatings while I can, and then my time will come later. So he's not putting up as much of a fuss as, as Daniel did there. But you look at the Red Bull test in Silverstone last year when the car was tuned to Ricardo and he was right up there. And if you look at last year as well, Ricardo got six points over the seven Grand Prix while also recovering from injury. Immediately out-qualified Yuki in Hungary and then did it on another two occasions. And Yuki got 17 points over the 22 Grand Prix. So it's it's still pretty close if you move that out theoretically over the course of a season. While this year the qualifying game has definitely been Ricardo's weak point, it's still only kind of even Stevens in the racing. I mean, Australia was the only race where there was a comfortable, measurable margin of Yuki beating Ricardo. But even that was down to the car a lot of it in terms of setup, them not finding it until too late in the weekend. They both come out and said that the team and and Ricardo. And you could also factor in that Yuki wouldn't have finished as high up as he did if it wasn't for the convenient DNFs further up the grid. I mean, I know you've still got to be in the right place at the right time, and that's fair enough, but I think Daniel underperforming doesn't mean Yuki is a better driver. It just means he's been able to do what's been asked of him and has been in the right place in the right time. And we know Daniel can do better, but we don't know how much more Yuki's got on him. And in his fourth year, it's fair to say that we've got a firm grasp of what he's capable of, which is the occasional good performance beyond his normal bound, but it doesn't appear to be anything more than that. However, if both continue as they are, mm-hmm. then stick signs or Lonzo in the Red Bull next to this time next year and then just go for a complete clean, clean slate, I think, for RB and put Lawson in a Wester in there because, again, it, Lawson last year when he stepped in, he finished ahead of Yuki in every Grand Prix except for Qatar. So qualifying, yeah, maybe you've got that. But if you can't repeat those performances in the race, then don't really give a pass. How should you are at qualifying if you can't translate that into points? And if you mapped Ricardo's six points over seven Grand Prix out for the rest of last year, I know it's a completely hypothetical, but it's just kind of what we've got to work with. He'd have been scoring more points than Yuki. So I think if they both continue down the route that they are, then fair enough, Yuki is going to be beating him. But there's not enough yet. And I think it's just so much hot air from people who just don't have anything better to be talking about in the news because it's a slow news week in some days. And it's just frustrating that it's Daniel there all the time because... Russell was outperforming Hamilton a lot at the moment, but if it wasn't for the fact they already knew Lewis was leaving to go to Ferrari, we wouldn't be jumping on that and going, oh, we need to get rid of Lewis now. Yeah, 100% agree. I think it's just with Red Bull, they, they're they very impatient, aren't they? They want to make oh, a move that. with their drivers. Uh, as You know, if they see a little bit of insecurity from one of their drivers, they want to make a move as quickly as possible. It's interesting, Checo's been there so long, though, you know, kind of like he didn't have a great showing in Melbourne, but they've been fairly patient with him, I think it's fair to say. Um, it's because it's they've still got the results that they want out of it, and it's not really they're not really threatened by anyone enough for it to matter yet. And as soon as that gap closes enough where they can see 
Ferrari or Mercedes or whoever scoring too many points away from that the one or both of the titles looks a little bit in doubt, mm-hmm. then it's going to be a problem. But he's doing just enough for it to not be an issue yet. And that's probably the only reason he's still there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you say as well in 23, Daniel did not too bad. Like his first race in Hungary was not too bad. So we're seeing these good performances and then these bad ones. So there's a lot of inconsistency there. And I just don't think he understands the issue it well enough to be able to then solve it. Like the first step to to solving is understanding your issue. And he's probably looking in a lot of different areas. And he was talking about the car in Melbourne not being right as well. So he's probably confused. And I think he just can't understand what's happening before then, you know, trying to work on the solution. I think that's just been the challenge. Um, but the gap here that we have, like 4.446 to Yuki in the first three races, it's not small. You know, it's the best part of nearly half a second. And that's for me, that's huge. It's big. So that is a concerning number. If it was a tenth or two and Yuki had that slight edge, you know, get to find, give Daniel some time and whatever. But four four six is is nearly half a second and half a second in motorsport. If you're if you're losing half a second a lap, you're getting caned. So it's quite a lot. I think that's why I'm kind of glad it's the qualifying, not the race, though, because while it was nip and tuck between the two of them in the first two races, obviously the qualifying compromised him in Australia. But if you look towards the last 10, 15 laps of that Grand Prix, he was making some good gains towards the end. I don't know quite why. I don't know if that was the card headquarters that they're talking about. It was why he was backing off a little bit from P11 because it looked like he could have maybe got P10 if he'd been on keeping that pace consistent there because he just seemed to close down P11 pretty well, Albon, I think it was pretty quickly. But for some reason, then the gap would open up again. You're like, ah, oh, why, why is this happening? So I think it's just finding that understanding and admittedly missing fp1 in japan isn't necessarily going to help but at the same time if the weather holds for as messy a grand prix as potentially going to have it might not make too much difference anyway and like i said with with yuki he's just in the right place at the right time in australia in a lot of respects and that's half the job in f1 as we talked about i think in, in the australia review martin that does help you and if ricardo can just stay out of trouble maybe it would be better if he qualifies at the back of the grid in japan because he can get rid of missing all the carnage happening out front yeah. I think the mistake that he did in Melbourne was also telling of the pressure that he's under because you know when you turn into the corner from the entry stage and the mid stage, you've got a fair idea of where you're going to land on the exit. And he kept his foot, he kept his foot in that knowing. And, you know, it wasn't a, for me, it wasn't a small error. Like he's gone well outside of track limits and he's obviously pushing. So he's under pressure and he just kept his foot in it. So, uh, it surprised me that he didn't get out of it because he would have known, but it doesn't surprise me in one sense because he's under so much pressure and he was he's searching for some lap time somewhere and he doesn't know where it is. So he kept his foot in that one and and ran wide and lost the lap. So that contributes obviously to the to the average. But look, it's part of the data set. A mistake is a mistake and you've got to pay for that. And the gap is four four six. I think that's part of what Mekis was saying as well was that he's surprised about how much pressure Daniel himself was putting him under because they and the team have been saying that don't worry about it, you'll get it. It's just, yeah, we'd like you to be further up, but you did a great recovery drive there. Yeah, we got an air qualifying, but beforehand, just don't put so much pressure on it. And I think he needs to maybe take a leaf out of Piastri's book in that sense then and just be like, okay, this is what it is. Get on with it and don't overthink it. Just go for that feel of the natural kind of talent that yeah. we know he's got in the car and I think maybe it's just as much as he says it's not the McLaren issue is falling over it probably isn't that but it's just the mindset and just maybe he needs maybe it's more of a, a mental thing than a physical thing because once you've got your head sorted out then we know from other drivers it can change like that yeah so overthinking's the, the key word and second guessing as well when you're driving a Formula 1 car thinking or there's a bit of doubt there or you're not sure you can't go racing like that. So maybe when he was young, that's like Horner said, he was taught some bad things in McLaren, and he's not been helped out enough to to unravel whatever whatever those things were, so he can get back to what yeah. we know he's capable yeah. of. Yeah, I agree. Meanwhile, there's been further discussions about sort of other seats in the Red Bull field, and Christian Horner has revealed there's been conversations with Fernando Alonso looking to join Red Bull. At the same time, sites contract negotiations also rumble on with Red Bull making promising noises in his direction. But there's been so little discussion about Sergio Perez this whole time. He sort of reportedly signed a contract extending his term at Red Bull, but none of that's been sort of actively announced. So we've got 
three very interesting drivers all vying for what is a very interesting seat in one of the topmost teams. Well, if you believe Eddie Jordan, it's going to be Sainz and Alonso at Aston Martin next year, which I'm not totally against, to be honest, as a as an all-Spanish lineup for Aston Martin. As for Perez, contract with Red Bull could be as a third driver for all we know. We really don't know what they're up to with him, and I wouldn't trust Red Bull until I've got it in clear black and white writing. And even then, I'm not sure if I, I trust it. So, Yeah, look, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. I feel like Carlos would be a a much better fit than Fernando next to Max. I don't think Fernando will happen. Like putting Fernando and Max in the same team. No, that won't happen. Um, but Carlos could. They've been teammates before. Carlos has been brought up in the Red Bull family when they were at Toro Rosso. Carlos is not an agitative character like Fernando. He's strong. He'll 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 go really well. He'll learn off Max if he needs to learn off Max, and he'll. I think it would be like, it makes sense for me. I always thought Fernando made more sense in the Mercedes because they need a, someone of world champion, world champion and world championship caliber in that car. George, as good as he, as he is, I don't think, and he, obviously the numbers show, he's not, he hasn't done that world champion. He doesn't have that sort of experience yet. So if you're going to fight Lewis Hamilton in a Ferrari, Max Verstappen in a Mercedes, you need Fernando Alonso in, in sorry, Lewis Hamilton in a Ferrari, Max Verstappen in a Red Bull. You need um, Fernando Alonso in a Mercedes. That's that's my opinion. I think that needs to happen from Mercedes. Otherwise, they're in they're in real deep trouble. So I think they actually need Fernando at this point, and that makes sense for me that Carlos joins Max. But let's see. We'll see how that one all boils out. Meanwhile, there's been sort of shifting sounds at McLaren, but not with their drivers. They've made a sort of series of technical changes in their departments. And key among them is the departure of David Sanchez, who just a few months into starting his new role at McLaren, which has um, sort of left. And McLaren only announced his arrival on the 10th of January this year. He was a former Ferrari aerodynamic specialist. And he was one of the big signings the Woking outfit made over winter, the second being ex-Red Bull technical wizard Rob Marshall. And Sanchez has vacated his position as Technical Director of Car Concept and Performance. Rob Marshall now assumes the role of Chief Designer. Neil Haldy moves over to become the Tech Director of Engineering. And Peter Padromo will continue his role as Technical Director of Aerodynamics. The Concept and Performance Department will be streamlined to focus on performance more so, with team boss Andrea Stella assuming this role as it's reworked, essentially. It's sort of dialed back and reworked under his stewardship. So it's it's interesting what they're seeking to change. They've also recently, I think it was earlier today, announced they were um, weren't renewing Emmanuel Piro's contract as their junior driver development sort of coach. So some interesting changes coming out of Woking. It's a bit of a funny one with Sanchez because it almost screams of, oh, we meant 2025 when we thought about gardening leave or something. That's why we can't have him for now because it seems just so curious to get rid of. Like you cut, how badly have you messed up your job in less than? three months that you would be canned from McLaren, it, especially when they've probably gone into quite a bit of it to get you there in the first place. So it, it doesn't seem like it could be that. Then why get rid of him if he's doing an all right job? So it's it's a bit of an odd one. And I'm kind of, I want to dig deep into that one if I can find out anything about that. Yeah, nothing to add from my side. I think, uh, you know, these things happen. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's Politics. instability in the team. Yeah, it's instabil- some instability in the team, but... You know, it's kind of at that level where hopefully it doesn't affect lap time and performance. I don't think it's going well, to affect Piastri anyway because he just keeps calm and carries on, doesn't he? Just soldiers on through anything. I don't think it's really going to affect this year's car, certainly not too much when it comes to development, a lot of which will have likely been sort of already baked into the project. But it's it, it makes you question a little bit sort of the internal running of McLaren and sort of the the setup of personalities within that unit. But we'll move on from that to something a little more positive and optimistic for the future. And, well, it's the champions of the future karting series, Timo. Yeah, this one kind of flew a little bit under the radar unless you were really looking out for it. And I was kind of somewhere in between that of just, oh, yes, this was meant to be happening. I should probably take a look at this. Um, so last weekend at the Ceremony at International Circuit in Italy, we had the first meeting in one of six that will take place throughout 2024, which is basically part of F1 Academy's, to borrow a phrase from extremely legacy program sort of thing of trying to encourage the next generation of drivers to come out and at the very least have a go at racing and just see what's out there and don't have to worry about the money as much. I mean, we've got famous karting factories such as Paralin and Car Republic for the chassis. 
TM Carton IME, IA. That's easy for me to say, IAME for the engines and Vega for the tyres um, in terms of equipment. So it's kind of, they're all being supplied for everyone. So it's just purely on the talent side of it. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about anything else. Just go out there, drive, and you're all extremely young. And we won't even look at the years you were born because it'll make us all feel ancient. But it's just that sort of thing of let's see what we've got out there. And you've got a few familiar names if you're paying attention to the. Those see these sorts of things quite interesting. A few which names were jumping out, and then happily, most of them were unknown to me at least because they are brand new. And all the other water on YouTube. And Luna Flux is leading the way in the championship in her category. There's three categories, I believe, and she's in the oldest one, I think. Um, and just nice to see Susie there doing her thing and taking care of potentially filling up the grid for F1 Academy at least a little bit for next year because, as we know from the two-year rule, a lot of those drivers currently on the grid will not be coming back next year, whether they like it or not. And we were wondering this in, I think, the F1 Academy preview, Jesse, about who is going to come in because everyone knows about Jess Hawkins and Jamie Chadwick and Sophia Flush, but they can't really go into that because they're already aged out of that program. Um, so this is the perfect way to, to keep that going. And we've got another round next up in May in Valencia, then back to Italy in July. Then we've got two rounds in the UAE, one in October, one in November. And then we've got another round, which is actually confirmed as a place so that's going to be an Al Forsan in December, also in the UAE. So that's going to be interesting that we've got three rounds there. And kind of like that because it does help with the whole promotion of women in motorsport in that region. You're having a lot of female friendly stuff in the most sports space happening over there at the moment and it's nice to see it's not just one off events and oh look we've done it and then you never see it again at least this way it's very consistent with very young girls and women coming into it and hopefully as it says we get a champion of the future yeah i'll go off your last point with having three rounds in the uae it's a huge sort of melting pot for when it comes to sort of middle eastern formula four you get a lot of the um indian f4 series drivers will come over and do it there so it is a sort of great very central location for a lot of asian nations to come together in middle eastern nations and equally it is bringing together um drivers from nations that don't typically have karting series you look at things like europe and america which have big karting series already in existence so this is sort of very much the follow-on from their discover your drive series which is their uk based sort of mm. just come and have a go karting series which you literally rock up if your times are good someone from f1 academy might get in touch with you that sort of thing and this is the next step up where you start sort of karting semi-pro and so on and i mean lena flux we've said is in the okay and senior category senior is a real stretch of the term there because i think she's what sounds 14. like a dog food yeah. brand <laughs> but we're looking at genuinely like we said sort of not even the next generation of talent for f1 academy but the generation after that the ones that will almost certainly be making that huge step into f3 f2 and likely f1 these are where those drivers are going to be sort of coming from in years to come and it's it's really nice to see the big support coming from the proper karting manufacturers coming from the big karting circuits and the fact that it's sort of being incorporated into weekends with the ability to also watch it on youtube it's getting these drivers out there in front of sort of talent scouts and getting chance for sort of worthy drivers to get spotted and get the support the coaching the opportunities that they really warrant if they are properly quick enough and given and it makes the job for those those people who are going out talent spotting that much easier they don't physically have to go to all of these places they so often have had to do they can actually just go on youtube now and watch it i mean it's it's one of those things where if it's not on youtube maybe there's a facebook link to it or something like this and you've got to find all these obscure links bookmark them make sure you double check that they've not changed from one race week into the other but now it's all sort of the youtube one place for everyone that's great and just from from that aspect and like you say as as a as a fan base you can get on these drivers much earlier than you ever would have been able to before and we talk about watching in my case oscar piastri coming up through f3 and f2 and seeing the one and they'll probably watch his entire career you can take that even further now with some of these drivers. If you see one or two names that you just randomly decide to support, because why not? And they happen to go a bit further. It's going to be very interesting as well, I think, for you, Martin, from a data point of view, of you can see so much more progress over the years and decades than you can literally map it out from start to finish, potentially. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's a great initiative as well and, and can help feed into the F1 Academy. The, the thing is, though, like the way you drive go-karts is totally different to the way you drive open formula race cars. There are two key principles that are different. The first is there's no differential. So the karts have, actually have to lift that inside rear wheel in order to corner. So that requires a totally different technique with the steering that's the first one and the second one is downforce when downforce is active in the formula cars it totally changes the way you drive and when downforce is not active you, you know you need to drive in a certain way that being said you can wet lines race craft the feeling of the speed everything's still there i'm a massive karting fan slightly disappointed there's no kz2 category here because that's close to my heart as well and like the, the gearbox cards would really show a separation more of a separation and i think things happen so quickly in that category that it's potentially more relevant as well but again great initiative and good to see all the support from the manufacturers as well that's great stuff and um hopefully we'll see some of the drivers that we're seeing in these carts are heading towards the japanese grand prix in a couple of years time well there's a couple with a big pinch of salt there but speaking of the japanese grand prix we've really got to have a look at the race which we are previewing and well timo have you got some fun facts for us about the japanese grand prix just the one fact this week, but it's something that not everyone may know, um, as we've got people from all walks of life listening to this. So my fun fact with Japan and the Japanese Grand Prix is that during one of the first motorcycle events held here, Ernst Degener was badly injured at the far corner leading to the bridge underpass, and the East German driver was able to recover from the serious burns he sustained, and the long curve was then split into two and then named after him as a result. So if anyone was ever wondering why it's called that, that is why. The history behind the Degner curves, never knew it, which um, sort of leads us nicely on to our predictions. And we've already mentioned this is quite a technical circuit. It is very tight with quite a narrow actual sort of band of tarmac that weaves around and makes it. But who do you reckon is going to be setting the fastest lap time round in qualifying? Who is going to be taking pole position? Ellie May has submitted her predictions in her absence and she's gone for... The rather sort of straight down the line approach of Max Verstappen, but Martin, you've gone the same way. It's interesting to hear what what made you choose that one. Uh, look, the car driver combination it's it's high speed, so like Max is very strong in in that in that situation, um, and like just the way he dominated the the track previously in the past as well. I think it'll be a return to form for Red Bull and Max, and yeah, that high speed nature. Like we've seen Max maybe struggle a little bit in tracks like Baku or maybe Monaco sometimes or Singapore in these kind of. But this is classic Max. This is old school. This is high speed. This is downforce active. He's gonna. I reckon he's gonna smash this year. He's not looking to try and get release out of slow corners. It's a lot more sort of fluid to really just sort of pin the car down and chuck it through. Yeah, things corners like Spoon, where you can just send the car in on the entry. He'll he'll be carrying the most speed through corners like that. Degna one and two, the S's. It's all you know entry speed. So yeah, I think Max will do really well. And it's a proper old school circuit. You can really lean on the curbs at certain points. Certainly the exit of Spoon, there's a really nice line if you push it properly to the exit. If you watch any of the old um, Mansell years, it used to be his proper corner exit was really winded out to the far edge and it just gave him a bit more of a run to 130R. It was a really interesting technique because everyone tried to hug it a bit sort of tighter. But um, Timo, you've gone... It's one of those corners where it really separates the, the men from the boys in some sense. And you saw that last year in a weird way with uh, Hamilton Alonso, none of which he'd ever accused of being boys in, in F1, but it's just kind of Lewis showing why he's got five more championships than Alonso in some respects. It's sort of like, oh, I can overtake you here, and I'm going to. It's like, oh, shit. If you can find the line, you can make the pass through there. But Timo, you've gone for Red Bull, but different side of the garage for your pole position. Yeah, I mean, it seems cruel when you look at the rest of my predictions, but I want to give him a ray of sunshine because he seems to have blown under the radar a bit this season for whatever reason so far and that's Sergio Perez so you know what that's her pole position in the Japanese Grand Prix and that's going to be where he peaks for the weekend a bit rough that's going to be his peak for the weekend um, Ellie May's podium though we'll move on to the end of the race she's gone you forward. forgot about your pole position Jesse oh my pole position which is actually <laughs> quite a left field one um, Charles Leclerc I think the, the Ferrari has got a new edge of drivability to it 
And there's there's an aspect that I'm hoping that it's sort of going to unlock a little bit of going into Suzuka. I don't think we're looking for quite the same sort of power delivery. We're not looking at too many slow corners, like we'd said, for things like Monaco and Azerbaijan. So it's going to be able to really sort of lean into being quite sort of, not necessarily languid, but certainly a car that you can pour into this circuit a bit more readily than otherwise. And I think Charles might have an opportunity to maximise that. Certainly over one yeah. lap, it might be a bit too harsh in its tyres for too many consecutive series your pole position does also help Ellie May and Martin a lot with who they predict for the win because there's a much better conversion rate for their Grand Prix winner prediction than it is Charles if he takes pole oh yeah Charles never wins if he's set pole so it means sort of um yourself Ellie May and in fact myself have all got a better chance with our winners Ellie May was um Verstappen science Leclerc she's gone for a nice sort of Ferrari double podium there no sign of Perez Martin you've gone for a similar idea, but you've inverted the Ferrari yeah. drivers. Yeah, the same, actually. I, I agree with you. I think the Ferrari would be strong around here as well. The only potential drawback is that Rebel's really good in a straight. And uh, when you come out of Spoon, you've got that, you know, you've got that long straight plus the kink mm. in 130R, so the load. Um, but I think it's not the key here with me is it's I've got Max and the two Ferraris for the podium and I haven't got Checo like like Timo because Checo's great in that low speed feeding in of the power, you know, coming out of slow speed corners like Baku. So, you know, in theory, I don't think he'll be that strong there. I think the two Ferraris can get in front of Checo here. It's going to be an interesting one. Timo, you've gone predictably strange with your podium. Well, again, I don't know if uh, I mentioned this in the Australia review, Martin, but I'm going for predictions where I don't think they'll happen. But if they do, it'll be a very interesting season. And considering my expectations for the season at the start of the year, and I still carry most of those, it will need it. And if I come away from this predictions game with zero points, I will be happy because potentially it means we've had a very exciting race of race season, or I've got a lot of points. No, no, sorry, I've got that completely wrong. If I have zero points, it's been a very dull season. I'm correct. If all of my predictions are correct, we've had a very interesting season, and I'm happy, and I win. So by that logic, Charles Leclerc wins, but not from his own pole position, because that would be silly, Jesse. I don't know why you'd be wanting that to happen. And then Oscar Piastri would do one better from last season and get second place. And then, because why the heck not Fernando Alonso in P3? It's a bold one. You've gone for the teammate of the guy that won the last race, the guy that just missed out on the podium at the last race, and the guy that was penalised at the last race. So you sort of really cherry picked from Australia some of those. It's going to be retribution stories. Yeah, and very bold, forward. but certainly possible. Certainly possible around Suzuka. Let's see how we go. We've if got it's as wet as they claim it's going to be, it's doable. Yeah, we'll see what the weather forecast is. Meanwhile, I reckon Science is going to be running on a bit of a high and could take the win here. Again, I think if Ferrari are able to carry forward this sort of slightly more sensible strategy calls that they seem to be able to make, certainly this season at least, he's got a chance. And I think Verstappen is coming into this one with a lot to prove. He hasn't won a Grand Prix on a Sunday yet this season. So there's a lot to really sort of think about. And... I think, I don't think it's going to get in his head, but I think there's going to be errors possibly creeping in with Red Bull. I think there's a lot of pressure, a lot of discourse around the team. It might be the thing that finally starts to set them on edge. Be interesting to see. And I sort of want to see what Ferrari does in response. Hence the reason Sainz winning, uh, Verstappen second, Leclerc third. Um, As much as I love Leclerc, I think this is a season where he's again going to play an unfortunate second fiddle to Sainz. That's going to be an interesting dynamic because... Suzuka is a confidence circuit and who's got the most confidence at the moment? Carlos. So let's see how this weekend plays out and does Charles, this is where, you know, do you second guess yourself? Do you doubt yourself? Or does he come into Suzuka with a world of confidence as well? Just not, not an organic natural confidence, but just confidence in himself and how he knows he is as a driver. So let's say it'll be interesting. Carlos is going to be full of confidence. The Melbourne win is worth in my opinion, it's worth a lot because the whole city gets behind you. The, there's a lot of Italian community there, the crowd and everything. So it really, it's really going to boost Carlos here. So that's what I'll, I'll be keeping an eye out for the, for them between those two. Mm. We'll move into then the fastest lap. And I don't know if this one comes down to more the car or the driver, but we've got a complete 50-50 split across the sort of predictions we've got in front of us. Two of us have gone for science. Two of us have gone for Verstappen. Ellie May's gone for science. Timo, you've joined her on this one. 
Well, yes, because as you will recall from the Australian Grand Prix preview, I said it's not going to happen this weekend. It's going to wait until I'm going to predict it's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be the Japanese Grand Prix where Carlos Sainz is going to get the fastest lap of the race. And it was always going to be Japan. And like Martin was saying, he's coming off a high from winning the last Grand Prix. He's going to have that extra speed and therefore fastest lap. So it's a, it's a no-brainer, really. I mean, it, I've been saying it for weeks and months, but it's going to be the Japanese Grand Prix. You've been saying it across two seasons now. I think it, eventually, it's, statistically, it's got to happen at some point. Um, happen. Martin, you've gone for Max. I've gone for Max, but I'm not confident on this one. The fastest lap, whoever's on the best tyres at the end. And, you know, if the car's kind of half decent, it could be Red Bull, could be Ferrari, it could be a McLaren, probably won't be a Mercedes or further down. So with not much confidence, I've gone Max. Uh, let's see how the race plays out. It could be a late safety car, someone on a new set of softs. It could be someone like Fernando. It, who knows? It's a circuit that really does sort of benefit from getting rubbered in. I don't know what support series we've got in across the weekend to sort of tell me how that'll impact it. But yeah, I think I've gone Verstappen as well. I can just see him, especially if my sort of general race prediction of Red Bull sort of having a bit of a fluff somewhere, he could be fighting his way back through and that'll be where he comes out towards the end for a final stint on softs and really puts in a fast series of laps. But uh, yeah, or possibly Red Bull just trying to take the wind out of Ferrari sails by going, don't forget, we are still quicker. So we'll see how that one pans out. We'll get into the slightly more sort of wild end of the spectrum with our wild predictions and ellie may has gone for a danny rick top 10 which uh, feels a little early in the season to call that a wild prediction but given the sort of form we were discussing against yuki maybe that's quite fair for a wild prediction um timo you've gone for something that's equally quite a scathing p4 and 5 for mercedes in the grand prix i'm doing the old tough love routine yet again in the hopes that it works as well as it has done Pretty much every other time I've done this, actually, on this podcast, and they need to sort themselves out very badly. As you and I discussed, Martin, last time out, it was, I mean, a double DNF is rare for them, and for completely different reasons, neither of which should have really happened. So they're going to pull their thumbs out for this Grand Prix. And while they won't get on the podium, they'll get P4 and P5, and they'll sort their collective doo doo out. And that is going to be very nice for everyone to see, but it's just still shy of where they need to be but give them that extra motivation to be like okay that's good now we need to go after those podium places yeah it's interesting with mercedes sorry just to just to jump in there have we seen that james allison was not present at the melbourne grand prix and uh toto wolf's not going to be present here in japan is is that right and what mm -hmm. do we think about that <laughs> I don't think it means they're an entirely rudderless ship, but there's certainly sort of aspects of it that suggest they aren't taking this season quite as competitively as possible. It's sort of no secret at this point that Lewis is doing a lot of chassis development work for them, a lot of sort of early development when it comes to new parts. So he's always got the experimental bits, the novel setups. And George is the one that's being left to go and hunt down points or usually the back end of Fernando Alonso's Aston Martin. So it's, yeah, there's... There's an interesting structure that's coming into Mercedes this year, and I think it's a team that's sort of resigned itself to look for the next thing. I think they realise they've come too late to this sort of style of car with the sort of the side pods that they've found to work, um, which isn't to say that there was anything wrong with the sort of no-pod design, which Red Bull seems to have sort of finessed a little bit. But there's, there's something about the Mercedes this year that just isn't sort of pushing to its full potential. There's, there's a different sort of technical directive going on there. Yeah, I just feel like the key it's personnel kind of in a time like this should be present. Uh, with James last time out in in Melbourne, Toto this weekend in Japan of all tracks. Uh, let's see how they go. Just feel like team leader team. is Lewis in some respects for both of those areas, and in a way does show how much of a team player he is that he's helping a team to get back to the front that he's not going to be with any positive things that come from these experimental parts that they put on his car and the feedback he gives them. I don't know, assuming it's all reliable stuff he tells me, he doesn't decide to do a real mean thing and just decide to start feeding them false information about what works and what doesn't. It's going to be potentially to his detriment next year, but I don't think he really minds or cares about that because he genuinely wants to see them do well. And I think that's, why he will do whatever he can here and maybe takes on that leadership role where Toto and James are absent for one or more races and he'll get that extra satisfaction potentially in the Ferrari next year of going, look how much better they are. I did that. And then I still beat them though. Mm. 
also being able to go to Ferrari and go, look what I was able to do for Mercedes off the back mm-hmm. of two flub seasons. Here's what I can sort of bring to the table here. I've sort of finessed my leadership skills, my development skills. It's it's opening up some opportunities. Uh, Martin, I want to pry into your wild prediction a little bit because I, I want to get some clarity before I write it into my big uh, prediction tracker. Crashes in qualifying, particularly from inexperienced drivers. Yeah, so the Japanese circuit is going to bite someone that even just makes a half a mistake. Qualifying is a highlight of the weekend for me. I sit down and watch Japanese qualifying like I do Monaco qualifying. I think the wild prediction there is that it could be someone like George or Yuki or potentially one of the more inexperienced drivers, maybe Logan, maybe Lance. I'm not sure. There, I'm just keeping an eye on qualifying and I'm just going to see who potentially just struggles with that pressure around the circuit like Japan. So I'm really interested to to watch Quali. I think there will be maybe a red flag of some sort. So I just want to see who it is if if it does indeed come at all. To, to that end, I think one lap qualifying also would have highlighted this even more. So they do have time, the drivers. So if they do stick it in the wall, you know, they've got multiple runs in Q1, Q2 and Q3. So if someone does stick it in the wall, it's a really bad one. So let's see what happens. But that's that's where I'm coming from there. It's it's that the pressure combined with the circuit, combined with these heavy cars, maybe someone like Daniel, for example, as well. It's just going to be, I think there's going to be a crash. It does remind me, Williams have fixed that chassis for this weekend, so it's all back to normal now for them, and hopefully it stays that way. I know you said it could be Logan, but I really don't want to be Logan. They've got enough trouble <laughs> as it is at the moment. Let it be Lance or someone else, please. Yeah, I'm sort of Let's hoping it isn't go, Logan, yeah. because I've got both the, out, the Williams drivers sort of tied together when it comes to my world prediction of Logan to outplace Albon, although that does sort of lend the possibility of they again write off a chassis, and this time they at least let Logan have a go in the one that still works. Um, I just feel like he's... He's finding a bit more of his form, a bit found his feet a bit more with this car and possibly Suzuka. He's sort of been out in Japan a little bit ahead of time. So he's sort of settled to the schedule, settled to the time zone a bit better. I just feel like he might have a chance to do something interesting here. The Williams is a bit sort of undetermined at this point. I haven't quite sort of pinned down what's what's what with their car this year. It seems to be sort of just solidly average across a great variety of sort of aspects. But I think better than the Alpine. Better than the Alpine by a great measure, but it'll be interesting to see what Logan's able to produce from it. And I think that it's circuit where going into it with confidence is going to be great. And he's going to be going into this at least with ambition. I think that is uh, just as valuable a tool, I think. And as well, if the weather prediction is staying consistent from what Autosport at least seems to think it will be, then again, just staying out of trouble in qualifying and the race could lead to some big points. And this is something exactly that Williams need to rely on is capitalizing on those sorts of opportunities where it can be. And if it's absolutely tipping it down, you don't need to be fired. You just need to get to the end of the race and just wait for someone else to slide off the track all by themselves, because we've seen that many a time before. And just make sure you don't do it yourself and just focus on driving your car. Yeah, Williams are great at pulling a strategy, which is just get to the end of the race. And they're also sort of, certainly with George Russell. Look at Spark 2021. (laughs) Yeah, but also with the same driver in a Williams, they're well-versed with don't slide off the circuit and drop it under a safety car. See Imola 2020, I want to say it was. So yeah, Yeah. uh, mixed messages from Williams. They need Latifi back in the car as a a hungry 2021 sort of situation. Got lost very well there. Though, didn't he? He he turned at the wrong point down the exit road just ahead of... He didn't do that in the race though. No, but he blamed that on the car, which was strange. Um, Anyway, we'll move on from our predictions to just sort of some summation points. If anyone's got any final bits they want to chuck out that they're excited for ahead of the Japanese Grand Prix. I'm just hoping that with the spiritual start of the season sorted, we've got the prelude out of the way. We don't need to focus on that now. That was dull. We've got the proper start of the season sorted now. It's been interesting. Let's just hope it continues in that vein. That's all I want. Mm. I'm wondering if we're going to see any coverage of Yuki Tsunoda's karting competition as well, because one of the things he's set up across this weekend has been a sort of small karting tournament for young Japanese drivers. And he's sort of really grown up a lot coming into this year, Yuki has. And I'm hoping we're going to get a bit of, not height-wise, but certainly in maturity and sort of posture within the team and within the sport i'm hoping we're going to get a little bit of sort of additional coverage on that and i might even wake up early if they say we're doing an interesting behind the scenes with yuki on sort of what's been this revelation because i think he's an interesting driver so it'd be nice to get some coverage for him at his home grand prix 
Yeah, I probably want to talk about the rain a little bit as well, because when it rains there in Suzuka, Japan, it doesn't sprinkle, you know, it's, it really comes down cats and dogs. So, and then F1 has a habit of, you know, when it's very wet, let's, let's say it's not extremely wet, but when it's very wet, they don't like to run the cars, do they? They don't, we don't trust that full wet Pirelli tire at all. When, when it is those conditions, it's generally, you know, no one's on track and, you know, they won't run the cars in that condition. And then, you know, I've seen times where we wait for it to drain, where we completely skip that full wet tire and the cars then go out on the intermediate tire. So what does that mean for this weekend? Like if, if it is heavy downpour and the full wet tire is not good enough as we've seen that, you know, that's the, kept in the case previously and F1 are like, no, we're not, we're not sending the cars out. You know, what does that mean for the weekend? I think it's a bit of a shame that we don't run more often in those conditions. But that being said, like, you know, we saw was at Pierre last time out with that tractor and all that drama. Mm. So yeah, we need to keep all that in mind as well. Like, I still think there's a bit of work to do, A, with that tire, B, with the ride height of the cars, C, with the visibility. Like, there's just, we need to get right back to running in full wet conditions somehow. Uh, what do you guys think on that? I think it'd be great to see the, us go back to sort of the old days of proper wet weather running. We, Like you said, we you sort of see cars do laps behind the safety car on the full wets. And then mm. as soon as it goes green, stick on the enders and off you go again. So like... Mm. Let's, let's revel in the fact that this is supposed to be within reason a dangerous sport there is supposed to be an element of risk associated with this we're trying to find arguably the 20 best drivers and the 20 best cars that you can produce within a set of regulations surely those drivers should be able to drive in the rain and surely those cars should be able to work in the rain it's yeah i think we ought to see a bit more sort of properly wet running and it looks according to my forecast at least like friday is going to be the real sort of um decider on that one that's supposed to be very wet indeed and the same with sunday as well saturday is going to be mostly cloudy so um we could have some rubbered in running for qualifying but then uh, a completely green circuit once more for the race we'll have to wait and see yeah was it was it um fuji where 2007 or 2008 where we had that massive downpour and we had a fantastic race but it was it was pretty safe right like Okay, we had the odd, you know, spin and crash and whatever, but it was, we never thought really that, there, you know, someone, there was going to be damage, but Suzuka is a bit different. You know, it's, it's a tricky track in the dry, let alone the rain. And there's not big, deep runoff distances, right? So if you come mm. off, for example, at 130R or Spoon or wherever, you know, a wall is there to greet you very quickly. So let's see how that unfolds. Yeah, I think it was 2007. It was torrential rain at the start. And they actually started behind the safety car just to get the race going. And it was a lot of people yeah. recall it as sort of the race where um, Fernando Alonso lost the 07 championship. It was where he lost out a significant amount of points to Hamilton and uh, Raikkonen at that point yeah. as well. So really an interesting race. But um, yeah, Japan loves to throw out a good good weather conditions for racing. And um, like you said, the barriers are close and that can result in They're some close. fairly catastrophic crashes, especially if you watched Super Formula last season. There was a massive shunt mm -hmm. in the final round and we saw a car catapulted over the catch fencing. So uh, fingers crossed it won't be that dangerous and diabolical, but still interesting. That's all we've really got time for in this week's episode, though. We'll be obviously getting up uh, nice and early to enjoy the Japanese Grand Prix across the weekend. And in the meantime, if you want any more from us, where can people find you, Martin? Yeah, best place is probably Instagram, Lower Lab Time, uh, YouTube, Lower Lab Time, and lowerlabtime.com for all coaching products. Excellent. Timo, where can the people find you if they'd like more of your content? Well, much like Martin, but when it's actually up and working, Instagram will be a great place to go and check everything out. And in the meantime, on the curbs, the Nitro RX podcast, and is it fast to the principal ones that come to mind? Yourself? Uh, you can find me across Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok as at Jesse on Cars. And you can also find me writing for Classic Car Weekly. So go and pick up the latest issue, which went live on newsstands today and features 75 years of the Jaguar XK120, plus a few interesting auction bits and pieces hither and thither. So worth picking up, worth giving a read to. And um, we'll say a thank you to our listeners. And I've sort of done our usual trawl of the maps of where people actually listen to this podcast. And the latest one I found is Des Moines, Iowa. Um, lovely to have you. And feel free to send us a case of something from Exile Brewing. The Zoltan or Citrus Sky sound pretty banging indeed. So uh, happily received if you've got any beer floating around. Um, thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you again soon to review the Japanese Grand Prix. <laughs>